open. Um, low, uh, uh, open area with not much cra um, uh, not much of a canopy and low-lying vegetation. This is the ecosystem that settled out of the three million years of the Pleistocene, which was characterized by dramatic glacial events followed by melt. And there were like maybe a dozen of them. And of course, we did not get ice down here, but what we got was dramatic sea level rise and fall. And so it's not hard to imagine that as this process was happening, that sand would be washing over the entirety of Florida at times, and then leaving to maybe land, the ocean would be like 300 miles out that away from where we are now and happening again and again. So what it left were soils that are fine and sandy. I mean, you look down here, look at what's at your feet. Fine, sandy soil, oh. nutrient poor, low topography, which sort of prevents runoff too. When we get rains, we don't get a lot of runoff. It just kind of stands there because it's got nowhere to go. Everything's so flat. Yeah. And it doesn't percolate down um, really fast either. And key to all of this too for these plants is fire. Because Florida has the most lightning strikes of any state in the, in the, in the country. Really? And uh, we have um, like 8,000 ground fires still set a year. Of course, most of them are put out, extinguished. But before there was any possibility of doing that, those fires, ground fires, low ground <coughs> fires, not massive con conflagrations, would um, go for miles and miles and days and days. So the plants that could survive these rigors um, were kind of very special plants. And um, we're going to talk about these today, how they are able to live in um, such a, a, a rigorous sort of environment, um, how they work together even. This, uh, when, as I say, when Ponce de Leon arrived here 500 years ago, most of Florida looked like that. And it, and it pretty, and it, but of course the Europeans began to change things. And then in the 19th century, um, Florida was logged at a rate faster than the tropics are logged today. Wow. And so this ecosystem that you see does, doesn't feel like what we think of Florida very much, but in fact, it's, it's a relic. And um, there are important stories here that 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 we hope to tell you today. Can you tell us the Lee County Commissioners? Pardon me? Can you tell us stories of the Lee County Commissioners? Well, I would not be the one to be doing that, but hopefully they're getting the message and understanding. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, Ron, would you like to say anything before we head out? Oh, not really. Uh, I'm ready to go. Let's go. All right. Okay. All right. Like awesome. <laughs> okay. I'm time that Fleabane is in the name. Um, it was used in order to put on bedding or roundhouses or whatever in order to drive fleas and bugs away. So this beautiful little plant is oak leaf Fleabane. This little plant here, and we're going to see a lot of this too. Is star, is star Rush White Top, and it's a sedge, and it, it's not only beautiful, but interestingly, sedges normally spread their seeds by, by wind. This little guy does not. Its bracts actually attract insect pollinators, so it pollinates 
um, by um, uh, uh, through the use of insects. And um, as you can imagine, um, peas, if you know anything about legumes, um, they have nitrogen fixating nodules in their roots. And um, so they're a a able to actually grab nitrogen out of the air and incorporate it into their roots. And, that, and I nitrogen, of course, is pretty important um, for, um, for growth. But they not only help themselves with that, they also help the plants around them. So um, that's, a, uh, that's a pretty cool feature of this plant. The flowers, the seeds, when they fall, um, are great for feeding quail and um, other birds. They're very small little seeds, but very nutritious. Very nutritious seeds. A flower that is very common in, um, in the flatwoods. This is called, and this has got an interesting story. This is called um, Pineland um, Lantana? Heliotrope. Oh. Pineland Heliotrope. And you notice that it's a little white flower. Well, if you go south, if you go into the Everglades, you will find this plant also, and it will be yellow. Wow. And we are on very acidic soil here. Not bad. Um, and the um, uh, down in the Keys and the Everglades, the soil is more, more calcareous. In other words, the sand down there comes from shells and m the marine environment, whereas, believe it or not, our sand here comes originally from the Appalachians. We're at, one, at, at some point, um, they were as high as the Himalayas. They eroded. Um, then they, they washed into the Gulf, and the Gulf, then the, the sea, washed them back up here. So we have sand that is based on quartz, as opposed to shells and things like that. That is so pretty anyway, that's right in the on the acidity level of the soil. Maybe. Like a hydrangea. Yes. The more acidic the soil, then the... I forget which way it goes. Exactly. But the color changes. Exactly. Yeah. Before we get too far into yeah. this, I wanted to point out this is poison ivy. Oh. And, and it is really all over the place right now. That's poison ivy? Yeah. Yes, it is. This right here. Don't touch it. I'm not going to touch it. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, so don't. Don't stray. Don't, don't, yeah. Yeah. Um, because these two plants have a great story. Um, and Elijah, this is going to blow your mind <laughs> on, the, um, on the sable palm. To begin with, this is a sable palm. It is wow. the uh, Florida State tree, which is pretty funny because it's not really a tree. It's a palm. And the difference is trees are what are called dicots. They have branches. Palms are monocots. They are more closely related to grasses and corn and bamboo. They do not branch. They're very, very fibrousy. In fact, sometimes you can look up at the palms and see the fiber coming off of them. But um, this, these, all the plants in an environment like this are going to have to contend with all the things I was talking about before. But we also have hurricanes. We have darn serious winds. And so they've got to be able to withstand that also. So what this palm does is when it drops a palm seed and it germinates, instead of it coming up straight up like most plants do and thriving, instead it sends its trunk down and it may send it down as far as a meter. Like, that's almost a yard. Um, so the, the, uh, the, um, the trunk is growing down, and once it reaches about a meter, it actually makes a J and come back, it comes back up. This can take up to 60 years, 60 oh, years. Wow. So what is the advantage here? Why would a, why would a, why would a plant develop this kind of an adaptation? Well, you can have a whole stand of these, of these palm trees 
burn out or blow over and you still got protected exactly a protected group up. coming up so when some of us were driving through florida ever so many years ago a seed might have dropped and we might just be seeing the leaves of the palm um emerge out of the out of the ground now what, pretty amazing no is that specific i'm sorry go i'm sorry go ahead i just wonder if that was just specific to the sable Yes, okay. it is because the saw palmetto over over here uh -huh. uh, grows its trunk horizontally to the ground. So it's got a different strategy, a different adaptation to um, to uh, 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 in, in order to withstand the rigors of the environment that it's in. Now we can't see that with this particular saw palmetto right now, but. When we get farther on down the trail, we'll be able to see the trunks actually growing along the ground. It's You'll just have to believe me now. Um, so, so, could I ask you, yeah. speaking of this particular specimen here, about what age would this pretty darn good sized tree be? Well, if you're talking about after it emerges out of the ground, they grow much faster. And I don't know what that is. Do you, Ron? I would guess that that tree is probably about 15 years old okay. after it's come out of the ground. When they get older, you see these boots? Uh, they call these boots where the branches have broken off. Right. And uh, when they get, the way you can tell an older tree is when they get older, these boots will fall off. Aww. And the older <coughs> trees won't have them. And of course, they'll be taller. But I would say, I just guess from my experience, that's probably about 15 years old. Cabbage palm? This is also called the cabbage okay. palm. And it's called the cabbage palm because one year's growth, if you cut that out, and it's always going to appear at the top, remember, because no branching, the growth bud is always at the top, um, you can eat it. And it was a, uh, they would make um, cabbage. Hearts of palm. They do make hearts of palm out of it from the ones that are um, harvested in um, in Brazil. But it's the same plant. It is absolutely the same plant. Still a sable palm. Um, yeah. And if you go to the um, La Belle, um, the Cabbage Palm Festival, you'll have a chance to try it sometime. Mm -hmm. I think that happens in March. I want to show you something that may help you to distinguish sometimes between the sable palm and the saw palmetto. Um, you're not going to feel it, I guess, on these, but oftentimes the, um, the stem um, feels like it would cut your hand. Um, but look at how this palm is. Look at how right here it seems to have almost like a wrist. Mm -hmm. And so it's like this palm is giving you a high five. <laughs> With this palm, the sable palm, the branch almost seems to come out to the very tip. There's no wrist, almost the very tip of the frond. And um, so that's one way that you can kind of tell the difference. Heard that you're, uh, that, that whistle that you're hearing? Uh -huh. We're hearing an eastern towie. We may see that. Eastern towie. We may, yeah, we may see. And they're, and they're coming out. Um, they're making a lot of noise right now because it is spring. And, and um, be careful, don't get too close to the... This is all poison, poison ivy. Okay, now, we are, uh, there's a little trail here. They have cleared out the poison ivy. They've made this forest for a purpose. Is that a, that's kind of a promise. <laughs> I looked at it early and it looked okay to me. But I think if we do this by halves, in other words, half the group go in with me first and then we'll switch around. And um, the reason we're going in is because we ha there is a long leaf pine um, tree in its grass stage. It is, it is four and a half years old right now. Um, the long leaf pines are the ones that were logged out so heavily because there were a heck of a lot more of them here. And you don't see very many of them anymore because they were logged out and then replaced with slash pine. And they have planted some longleaf pine trees here. And they have their they are particularly adapted to withstand fire. 
So I want to show you what a grass stage is because later on we're going to see um, some mature um, uh, longleaf pine. Awesome. So I want half of you come in with me right now. So what's the baby pine? This oh. is... That's that? Uh, the, this is the young pine oh, it's, tree. It looks cute. <laughs> it does sort of look cute, doesn't it? Should I touch it? Um, you can certainly touch it. Anyone um, can uh, wow. can touch it. Um, the, 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 the young um, longleaf pine stays in this low grass stage for maybe up to 10 years. What it's doing is it is sending down a tap root wow. in order to find a, um, a dependable source of water. And so it's going to stay in this stage until uh, 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 building up um, nutrients and um, um, making itself strong. And it's also waiting for fire. So, so when, this, it, it, when I say that, it, it's, that they're well adapted um, to withstand fire, um, these needles are actually very moist inside. And what the, what the tree will do is, it will, oh. um, it, the, the, the needles will come up like this. And they will protect the growing bud, which is right here. And they, um, because of the moisture inside, they will steam. And so it will never get up above the, uh, the temperature of, of boiling water. And that's apparently for a Cooler short period than, of time. Exactly. Cooler than fire. Exactly. Cooler than fire. And also, this, the, this, this white here, also reflects heat so it it pushes off heat from um fr from getting too too close in oh um I so I'll provide it. this um that's what uh, that's what a grass stage looks like and what will happen is once it once there's a burn and there's probably going to be a burn this this summer at some point prescribed burn um which will help this to, to grow, then this in three years will get up to be like five or six feet high. Wow. So, so imagine, this is four, four and a half years old at this point, and then it'll get, look at how low it is, and then it'll get up to be up to, that's Now, right, is this a long leaf pine up here? No. 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 So this slash. Is not. This is a slash. So slash pines are native. This one right here, this little guy? Um, that one, I do not believe so. No. It looks to me like um, it's a brown growing bud, so I do not believe that oh, it is. Okay. Let's do a switch, yep, and um, then we'll let the other people come in. About the um, about this other tree here, this this is slash pine. Some of the differences between slash and longleaf: a longleaf pine tree can get up to be 150 feet high. Wow. It can get to be four feet um, uh, Diam di diameter. Thank you. <laughs> diameter. Um, it can live 500 years. So that, and that's Whoa. probably the longest living thing that we have here. Um, it also has a bark that is um, very corky and nicely layered. And so it tends to withstand fire extremely well. Um, it will not develop any branches until the tree gets up above the level at which fire can be expected. Wow. Yeah. 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 These are, well, these are all the adaptations. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. After over millions of years, these are the plants that survived because there were probably plenty of plants that tried to move into an area like this and did not have the right ad adaptations and never made it. So, uh, so these trees, the, the longleaf pines were logged because they were, they were so tall, they were so thick and they had the, and they're filled with resin which is really able to withstand insects and um, uh, uh, disease 
and that kind of thing. So they were used for um, railroad ties. They were used for in all sorts of construction. Um, they were used uh, to, to build ships. And uh, up until 1920, um, Florida was the rosin and um, turpentine capital of the United States. Wow. And so they were tapped. They were tapped for their sap, and there's only so long that you can let that go on without the, the plants dying. So, um, and the slash pine, in contrast, what, what they did was, once they pulled out, or once the, the longleaf pine died, they replaced them with um, farms of slash pine, because they grow fast. They will, they, they'll grow up to 57 feet, believe it or not, the southern, the south Florida slash pine, 57 feet. And um, they only live uh, for about 100 years as opposed to 500, but they grow very, very fast. And they don't have that stage that you saw before and the slow growth. Uh, yeah. When you mentioned about that waiting for the fire, okay, if a fire were like this summer, all mm -hmm. right? what would be devastated around it? It would survive. That's such a good question. What Thank would you. be devastated around? That's a great question. One of the reasons, because it also explains why this is all so open. Um, the, what would be devastated are the grasses, the herbs, all the low-lying stuff, mm -hmm. plus um, the, the saw palmetto, to some extent, too, would also be destroyed because this can keep on growing and growing high. So all the low-lying stuff would be taken down to the ground, but that's not a problem because, again, the plants that you see here that are living in association with the pine trees have, over time, developed the ability to grow from their roots all their nutrition is held inside of their roots. If, they, if there's a managed burn or they would naturally burn during the summer. All of the, um, all of the nutrients are, are, in the, are in the root system. So they would then um, just regenerate. And there are, there are plants that have rhizomes that you know send out um, runners and they can send up you know, their, the plant you know, all along the length. Um, and many of these plants, too, also really need fire in order for their seeds to, to open up. They're fire dependent. They're more than able to survive fire. They're fire dependent. They thrive in fire. Wow. If this, if there's no this, fire, will this little exists. one you just showed us, it'll still thrive. Right? Just it would still thrive, but eventually what would happen is something called succession. If there was never any fire here, you would have more and more of a buildup of these bushes that then slough off their, um, their branches and everything else, and the, the soil becomes more and more organic, which is better for a whole different kind of plant. And, and those are the oaks. Those are the hardwoods. Those are the hardwood oak trees. Those would start to grow, and then they would shade out eventually. That tree that we just saw, that might survive. But the other young pine trees, several years down the road, might not, because they get shaded out. Aww. I wanted to point out, you know, yes. talking about the, the plants coming back. This was all burned, what, about four years ago? Yeah. Mm. See, uh, this, it's all back now. We'll, we're going to see there was a, this was a prescribed burn here. Over around the back side there was a wildfire last July. Oh, and wow. uh, we can see, we can see how fast that's grown back. It's only been less than a year. And like I said, this is probably, this is less than five years here. And, and what you will get to see with that is what happens in a conflagration when trees are allowed to grow too close together. And then you have a really damaging fire. So we're actually going to walk this way. Oh, sorry. You're fine.
You said that you they planted twelve thousand of the long leaf. Yeah. Are those all doing well? I mean, the majority. No. Doing well good question. Them? Good question. Out of the twelve thousand trees that were planted, only fifteen to twenty percent are still surviving. But this is actually good. This is actually a pretty good rate of survival. It's it mimics what would happen in nature because we don't have irrigation here and we don't have any you know um, fertilization. We don't have any. We only have natural natural fertilization. So the hardiest to survive. Exactly, and that's what you want. Stuff right here. We have gopher apple, which is a low lying plant. It doesn't have any um, actual apples on it that I can show you, but um, they kind of look like uh, oak leaves. And they put on a fruit that gopher tortoises love. And this is an area where there are lots of gopher tortoises. And we've got the pawpaw. I've this, heard those. A, a pawpaw plant. Um, that, this is an example of how plants will develop chemicals in order to dispel browsers. In an environment like this, um, you've already got kind of a hard life, so you don't want co something coming along and munching on you. And so this has some very um, strong chemicals in it, that in the in the leaves. But interestingly, in nature, there's often some critter that keeps up with the chemical changes. And in fact, if you see zebra longwing. Butter butterflies. Zebra swallowtail butterflies. I'm sorry to have it's actually zebra swallowtail butterflies. Yeah, I've heard of they, they, this is their larval plant. I mean. So they can withstand the chemicals that um, that this plant puts out. And uh, so plants will put out chemicals that are sometimes just bad tasting. Um, sometimes they're so toxic they'll kill you. And we're about to see a plant that um, that, that can happen with. Um, the this is the pawpaw, yeah, and we're going to see some pawpaws that are um, actually in bloom. What is this? It's got a really nice shaped leaf. Oh yeah, this is muscadine grape. And muscadine grape um, it, uh, puts on a lovely edible fruit that can be eaten right off the vine or made into wine. Hmm. So this is the plant that is actually has toxic chemicals in it. And in fact, if you go on to the US oh, CPA site, C, ASCPA, it's anyway, the Wildlife uh, uh, Protection for, um, for Pets, they say do not grow this in your yard. What was that called, ma'am? It's called staggerweed. staggerweed. Um, uh, and it's called staggerweed because um, it actually will make browsers um, uh, uh, sick to the point that they stagger and may die. Um, it, uh, it, I think if you look, at, look it up, it's um, Rusty Lionia also. And if you look closely, this is in the same family as, um, as blueberries. And you'll notice the little bud here. If you, um, as we leave, if you come up close, it looks very much like a, a blueberry bud. But also look at the leaves. Look closely at the leaves. Rusty Lionia is another name for this. And you will notice what looks like rust on this plant. Yeah. In fact, it's little tiny, tiny hairs, almost microscopic. And this is the plant's way, another way of grabbing moisture, believe it or not. Because without a, with, with all this open canopy up here, when the sun goes down, it gets cold here much faster than in, than in other areas. And so condensation develops. And the condensation, it, uh, the, the hairs give um, the plant more of an area for the condensation to collect. And then the condensation will just run down and we'll see it on, on some of the other plants and run down to the roots. Somebody asked about this over here. This larger tree over here is a strangle fig. And you can see it's 
see is full of fruit. See little berries out there? Mm -hmm. and it's a really a good food source for wildlife. Uh, it has a little fig on it. It looks just like your regular fig that you buy in the grocery store, only smaller. And uh, they can grow. You can see them a lot growing wrapped around, usually a sable palm, but they can grow independently like that also. It's true, and they're actually a very important food source because they put on um, figs, the fruit, three times a year, which is kind of unusual. Wow. So for birds, um, this, is, this is a very important food source. As small as it is, um, it's, uh, yeah. Wow. Is that figs that sell along the branches? Yes. Oh, wow. Isn't that wild? Prolific. Is yeah, this I'll about see. as large as it gets, Paul? Fortnars Beach at the Mound uh, House. It's it's probably five times bigger than that. Oh, wow. okay. Oh, that's a good point. You're right. I think even up at uh, the Calusa, um, even up at Randall Research, they have bigger ones. Good point. Is it? I haven't a, thought about that. Are those standalone? I've only seen them wrapped around other trees. Well, they probably started out wrapped around other trees. And what happens is they shade out whatever the host tree is, and then the host tree dies. They start out actually as epiphytes. The seed will land generally in a sable palm. That's probably why you don't... There was probably a sa another sable palm over here at some point. And it actually sends down the roots to the ground. So it's kind of just for the first part of its life, just collecting water and nutrients out of the air. And then finally, when it lands and sets down roots, then it will start um, its process of wrapping around the, the tree. Here briefly, because this allows you to see with a saw palmetto how the trunk is sent um, horizontally along the ground so that um, that is really a terrific protectant for the saw palmetto so that it isn't up high um, in, um, in winds or um, in fire. Um, and I do know that this, um, this trunk grows 1.2 centimeters a year. I had to do something as a, uh, in the master naturalist class that um, that use that particular figure. So anyway, that's but that's how that grows. So if you were to walk in there, I mean, say you could walk in there, then yeah. it'd be all it'd be just a web of these under your feet. Yeah. Yeah. So they're all just actually the, you know, the excellent. Okay. Cool. There are the trunks. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah, indeed. I never realized this. What we were looking at was the end, the bloom, or whatever you want to call it. Okay. These are. That's yeah. right. Yeah, these I are the end. That. Oh. <laughs> Although I'll tell you something, they pop up in the middle of the of the trunk too. They're not necessarily oh. just the end. Oh, all right, so they're also yes. junctions on them. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Um, this pretty little plant right here is wild pennyroyal. Yeah. I encourage you to um, rub your fingers yeah. on the branch along the, um, the little leaves. Oh, good. It has a delightful scent. It's sort of minty. And this is another um, plant that is using chemicals in order to keep away browsers. What was that called? Wild Pennyroyal. Wow. Very common here and very common in, um, in, these, uh, in, in flat woods like this. And these little plants right here are um, yellow-eyed grass. We're going to see more of this, I think. For example, of the yellow-eyed grass. Oh, yeah. Very pretty little plant. It's a pipe wart. This pipe is wart. bog buttons or hat pins. It's a, it's a pipe wart. Isn't it pretty? Yeah. Um, uh, Ron and I saw a ton of this just a couple of days ago. Um, and uh, I think we're going to see more of it. Um, but it's uh, just a real pretty little plant that likes some amount of moisture. So I'm guessing that that's why it's chosen to be along the path because the, the, um, the sand is a little bit more compacted here and so it would hold the moisture. Nice. 
uh, and Elijah has mentioned that um, he has a slash pine, and uh, you know they're not going to allow a, um, a burn, uh, a managed burn in in his yard. We can think of managed burns as sort of being us in our backyards, picking up the leaves, you know, and mulching them, and then laying them down again for the ash that what would be ash mm -hmm. out of the fire but then the mulched up leaves to um, release um, natural nutrients and all back into the soil but it keeps the 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 burnable stuff down so that it we don't you know create a conflagration these um, these holes they are made by armadillos oh. armadillos go after insects and so they're the ones who are, who are making little holes here. And for anybody who didn't hear, boy, we're seeing a lot of these now, yeah. the bog buttons and um, the hat pins. And you can tell by the name, bog, it, it likes moisture. moisture. So that's why you're seeing it here, because it happens to be have a little bit more moisture in this area. Are the armadillos just digging in to get um, insects? insects? They don't just live down there. No, they around. don't. Okay. Just to feed. Exactly. Yeah. The <laughs> they can detect, and um, so uh, so they just um, they just go for them. How do we know where there's gopher turtles? I always wondered how do people say, you know, say, oh, that property has gopher tortoises. Well, I never know how people know. Well, we're gonna see them around okay. the other side. Okay. So, and in fact, we're gonna see a bunch of them. They like another area that we're going into because it's had more frequent burns and that's better for the gopher tortoise. And I'll explain that when we actually get there. Um, we're gonna look at this tree because this is an, uh, a more mature than you saw before, a more mature long leaf pine tree. Um, and the, uh, one of the ways that you can tell if you are just looking from down here, up there, is that the pine cones are much longer on, an, on a longleaf pine than they are on a slash pine. Longleaf pine cones will get to be between seven and nine inches long, whereas the pine cones of a slash are about half that size. So this is a longleaf pine. Yeah. The one with the white band on it? The one with the white band on it. Exactly. And, then the next and we're looking up, one. what we're looking up at is um, the, uh, the pine cones. Yeah, the, also another thing is the long leaf pine it has three needles per bunch. Oh. And mostly, well, sometimes it'll be two, but about 80% of them will be three. Whereas the, uh, the slash pine is two, so that's a good way to tell. A little later on, you'll be able to see the buds will come out. They'll be real silvery. Uh, it's kind of hard to tell by the actual length of the needle. It's, it's the ground. true. It's true. But I didn't mention. I, I forgot to mention that that the needles themselves yep. are like 12 inches long, yeah, um, as opposed to slash, which are shorter. <laughs> That is amazing. You see, this is a, this is slash, this is long. So everything is long. Okay. Everything is long. That's right. That's right. Exactly. Um, I'm going to, since we stopped here too, I'm going to point this out. This is the fluorescence of a saw palmetto. Um, saw palmettos do get berries on them. And it's an important um, wildlife food source. Um, they, there was a, a fellow named Jonathan Dickinson, who back in the 1700s was stranded in Florida. His ship had um, shipwrecked. And his whole family, they were trying to get from Florida back up to their home in Georgia. And so he ate a lot of saw palmetto because he was essentially hunter, hunting and gathering on his way back. And you'd think that if that's all he had to depend on, you know, he might grow to kind of like the stuff. But he said that it tasted like rotten cheese steeped in tobacco.
<laughs> Whoa. So, not so great. What part was he but, eating? The, oh, the, oh, the berries. Oh, the berries. He was eating the berries. But they were actually a very important food source for early Americans, um, both uh, the Native Americans and the pioneers, because if you are sort of a hunter-gatherer, you have a hard time finding good fats to incorporate into your diet. And these, have, uh, these berries have naturally occurring triglycerides. Now the irony is that nowadays we try to lower our triglycerides, but in a hunter-gatherer society, they had, a hard, they had to actually search for those. So, um, and this is also the too plant sedentary. that they yes. use right. as a natural uh, medication for enlarged prostate. Mm. You know, you see the advertisements for saw palmetto. That's, they use That's the berries? berries. The berries. Yeah, mm -hmm. it is. <clears throat> what do they use it for? Uh, you know, prostate problem. Prostate problem. And that. Now, 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 now. Ooh, look up. Because, not up, up, but out. Uh, that's what I should have said. This is closer to the ideal that you want for a pine flatwoods. Because a healthy pine flatwoods is looking for about three trees per acre. So you really want a lot of space in between. Because if the trees get any closer together, there are um, like pine bark beetles that can then jump from tree to tree. Almost every pine tree has its own little neighborhood pine bark beetles. But they're not a problem unless everything gets too dense two bunched together. It's like us getting diseases from all of us living too close together. Um, the trees, in living too close together, then the, um, the pine bark beetles explode. Plus, if a fire does happen, when it's nice and open like this, you don't have, a, a tree can get burned, but you're not gonna end up with a crown fire that's going to spread from tree to tree to tree. Um, we're going to see where that happened. In fact, you can kind of see it over there. We're coming up on it. But, um, but that is part of the advantage of, of, of having trees well spaced. Um, also, you don't, you don't have too many plants that are um, reaching for the, into this nutrient poor soil. But you know what you do have? Something that you can't see. And it's a fungus. It's called mycorrhizal fungi. And it lives in a symbiotic relationship with these pine trees. And its roots are even smaller. The fibers of its roots are even smaller than the roots of, the smallest roots of the trees themselves. And one teaspoon of mycorrhizal fungi will have seven miles of that fungi in it. And the fungus works out into the soil, and because it's so microscopic, these filaments, it can work in to get nutrients that are inaccessible to the actual roots of the plant itself. So there's a lot happening here that things are working in a symbiotic relationship with each other, oftentimes, sometimes not, but oftentimes in order to help each other survive. Um, this little yellow flower that you're gonna pass by, and I may have passed up some up to this point, this is St. John's wort. You eat the little um, sepals that are in the middle and get happy. <laughs> That's also a, um, an herbal, um, sort of a, a remedy to depression. But the downside is that if you eat too much of it, it apparently um, makes your skin sensitive to the sun. Oh, I, I, I should put in caution here. I do not recommend eating the weeds. I do not go along with Green Dean and recommend that people eat the weeds because there, there are things out here that can poison you. Just but like I suggested with the, um, the, the, Ivy. the, the, the stagger, stagger bush.
The preserve is 913 acres. Yes. There is our um, Galt Preserve. Is it Lee County? Then? This is Lee County. Park yeah. This is part of Conservation 2020. This is a con this is a 2020 preserve. So Galt is 2020. Galt is 2020 also. Okay. I think they just opened it like five weeks ago, right? I saw on the website they just opened it. A few months ago. Yeah. They opened it a few months yeah, ago. Yeah, it's brand new. Yes. Compared to all the others. Then. Yeah. I, I have to go. Well, there. it's been there a while, but they put in boardwalks and a part and a. Uh, a uh, uh, parking and um, is there access. like alligators there? I hope. I don't know. It says on the sign there are ah has alligators, wild hogs, and something else. Well, I, so where are those hogs so, uh, come from? The pigs. Where are those originally from? Spain. They came um, with the Spanish explorers. Wow, that and so I, they've been here a long time. <laughs> they didn't get rid of those things. Five hundred years. Yeah. Well, they do try to get rid of them. So, what is this plant? Of this? This. What's that? Well, this is grass, and we have like a myriad of grasses here. I would say that this is one of the witch grasses. Um, we have blue stem, we have different bunch grasses. I would say that this is one of the witch grasses because it has some red in here. And how are dead trees important to like animals out here? Well, the dead trees are the snags, and they're important to the um, uh, to the woodpeckers. Like, oh, like they want to eat the insects. They want to eat the insects, and they also want to burrow into the into the tree in order to um, have their little homes. Nice. Um, we're going to start seeing more of this, so um, kind of you all watch as I do, but this is blueberry. This is shiny blueberry. This is the plant, and it's not going to grow much higher than this, but we are going to see more of the, um, uh, more of this, this plant appearing, especially as we go around the backside. And you were looking at this. This actually is tar flower. And I was yeah. hoping that this is in the same family as, oh, good. We've actually got two together here. We've got two different plants, even though they look like the same plant. Oh. We have got, oh, you're okay. this is tar flower, and this is the rusty Ionia, or staggerweed. They're both members of what's called the Ericacea family. That's not so important, but... Um, Remember the rusty Lionia, these are little hairs that collect moisture. Well, if you look at the tar flower, their hairs are very evident in the fresh new growth, but they're just configured differently. They're on the stems. Hmm. But again, it's the idea that it's collecting moisture. Now, I think if you look around, you get the sense that this is drier than where we were before. Yeah. And look at how these petals, they um, are, uh, they're, they're very, um, they're almost like leather. They're a little bit leathery. And they're also facing like this. They're not like, you know, like that sitting out. Instead, they're like this. So any water that accumulates on them will run down to the roots. Um, they just have to develop all kinds of strategies, which are really adaptations, um, in order to survive in these harsh environment, in, in, a, in a harsh environment like this. Because we get tons of, sun, of rain during the summertime, some of which is going to be standing here. I mean, if Ron and I come in in July or August, we'll be in water up to here, walking through. Kind of like a big flood. Kind of like a big flood. Big. And, um... Then, yes, we got rain yesterday, and we've had some rain recently, but normally we're kind of in a drought period during the, um, during the winter. So, yeah. I, I apologize. Yeah, we not at all. This already. But this area here that's so clear, is that a natural occurrence? Or? That is from fire. 
That is because I don't even see the saw palmettos out there. Exactly, exactly. What they do is they will make grids and they will burn certain areas. That is a very easy area to burn because it's not close to homes, it's not close to roads. This is much harder to burn because it's right along Stringfellow. Mm -hmm. And the closer that you get to Stringfellow, they've got to be more and more careful about exactly the wind direction, how fast it's going. And so uh, there's a lot more that has to be considered in a managed burn that's close to cars and to homes. So how do they start these prescribed fires? Um, they have to apply for permits. Um, the question was, how do these, how, how does this process happen? And how and do they, they have make to the apply. fires? And how do they make the fires? Also? They actually have a canister that, creates, that creates fire. Gail? Yes? Yeah. I got some questions earlier yeah. about the little things that look like holly. And actually, they're little oaks. They are, uh, Baby. I would call them sand oaks. I think you call them something else. Yeah. And it's really interesting. This is one and that's one. And this Which is one? this and this. And like this is about as big as they get. Mm. But they are a true oak. As you can see, that one and both of these are blooming uh -huh. right now. Mm. Now typically, uh, an oak tree has to be about 50 years old before it blooms and has acorns. And these are doing it. So they may be that old, probably wow. older. It's true. But that's as big as they get. What did you call those? Sand oak is what I call them. There's another name yeah, for them. Yeah, um, we got like three different ones here. You're right, sand oak. There's also running oak. There's dwarf live oak, and there's scrub oak, and the and the sand oak. So we've got we've got all four here. They will never grow as tall as a typical live oak or laurel oak. They are meant to be low-lying and they are meant to live in an, in an ecosystem like this. And in a burn, then what they do is um, they will, the, the top will be burned off, but uh, it, the nutrients are in the roots. And so they will just spring right up again. And if they didn't get fire, they would eventually um, weaken and die. Because they're not meant, they're not meant to sustain exactly big, dense, high growth. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I'm glad. Yeah, I completely forgot about that. Thank you, Joan. This is a beautiful little flower. It's called Rose Rush. I'm going to get out of the, out of the of the shadow. Um. It, uh, it's, uh, it's taxonomic name actually speaks to the fact that there are no leaves or anything on it, but I can't remember what the, what the taxonomic name is. But, interestingly, it opens up, um, like from 10 o'clock on. So it must be 10, 19. <laughs> and you can see that it's actually open, just opening up. And um, it's uh, it's it's an in, in the aster family. It's um, so it's pollinated by insects. They butterflies. So by how butterflies. does how does it? Excuse me, but how do you, or how does it gather its moisture then if it's closed up all night? I uh, I would I don't know, but I would imagine that it, it is sitting leaves. in an area that um, see this all has a certain amount of moisture in yes. it. Yes. The thing is, with this type of soil, that um, it holds, it will hold moisture because underneath, underneath the sand, there is um, clay and silt. Mm -hmm. And so a as moisture falls, it doesn't like percolate straight down into the limestone. Right. Instead, it, it's kind of held in place. Well, the Just limestone's pretty close to the surface here, too. Good point. If you'll remember back when we first started the trail down by the uh, strangler pig, uh, there was limestone right on the surface. So I, I doubt that it's very far down here. And that holds some of the moisture here. So we may have to dig shovel at the bed to reach it. Yeah, you could dig it. You, you, you could dig it up, probably. It's only, I, I wouldn't doubt it's less than five feet deep or so. So wow. limestone is like a rock. Yes, ma'am.
Yeah. It's a very pretty flower. It is. Beautiful. Beautiful color. I know it. I know it. Isn't that interesting? We did not see two days ago, and yet we're missing some plants that we saw two days ago. That's right. It's changed since we were here Wednesday. Wow. Wow. We do these once a month. Well, we do this one once a month. There are. Um, oh, God! Oh, thank you! Oh, good. Oh, good, good, good. This is a great demo, too. Oh, this is so cool. This is one of my favorite, favorite plants. Okay, so this is sensitive pea. It is in the um, Fabrese family, which is also the pea family. Um, and it's called sensitive pea because I want you to watch what happens to the leaves when I rub my finger on them. Can you see? Can you see the leaves? Oh, yeah. Wow. Look at what's happening. They like move. Exactly. That's called seismonax seismonastic activity. I'm going to move this again. Do you see how they're moving? Yeah. And in fact, you guys can get in and do this yourselves. You don't have to hurt the plant. But what is happening is that um, the plant has a chemical reaction and it uses potassium to expel water uh, from the cells of the of the leaves and then the leaves go limp basically that's what's that's what's happening now why why such an adaptation i mean it sounds crazy doesn't it why such an adaptation they think that it is because with browsers that they might be put off by this movement along their lips <laughs> and so they go to something else that doesn't move. But also, uh, there are browsers that are insects, too. Browsers that are insects. And insects would be, like, kind of brushed off, pushed off, when the, um, when the leaves move. Isn't that cool? Yeah. So anybody who wants to can come and test. I'll hold this up. Look at also, th this is the most protective plant because it's got little thorns on it too. Mm -hmm. I mean, this plant does not want to be touched. <laughs> yeah. And you look at how beautiful the little flower is. Mm -hmm. It's just, look at this, it's wonderful. <laughs> so, come and, and if, you, if you just touch, yes! Okay. The last part of your group, we found some more sunfish plants. Oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Great! Done. That's that's cool, I mean, there's nothing like, um, you know, that multi-sensory sort of thing. Yeah. This is called Pretty False um, Papa. Oh. And if you can get down here, I'd encourage you to, um, I don't like to, to break off. There, there's not enough of this around, and you'll understand why I'm not going to do it when I tell you that um, this is a critically endangered plant. Mm -hmm. It is only found, according to um, Kathy Olson, when I took a photo of it, um, I looked it up on a, in a database, and I learned that it was critically endangered. And Kathy Olson, who is head of 2020, said that as far as she knows, it's only found on Pine Island and along Bur Burnt Store Road. Pretty false pawpaw. If you can run your fingers on it, it smells like magnolia. It's absolutely beautiful. So why the... It does. It's, it is critically endangered because... Its habitat is disappearing, and this oh. seriously needs burns. Yes. And who knows? See, there was a burn not too far from here, and it could be that some ash got around it, and I don't know. I don't know. That's all speculation. Well, we need to do anyway, burns before Doesn't it seem kind of interesting that it would start itself back on the path? Well, yeah. The light. It does, and it's, it's hard to know why, but there is more moisture yeah. on the path, too. Um, well, so it will grow a pawpaw, a pawpaw fruit, mm -hmm. and, um, but this is, I'm, I'm pointing out here, and, and Ron's probably going to do this, I, I don't know if he and I have talked about this, we're looking at a plant right now which is critically endangered, and um, it's only found on um, Pine Island and along Burnt Store Road, and it's this plant right here, In the whole you can get world. down and rub the leaves, 
Um, it smells like magnolia. It's just wonderful. So this pretty false pawpaw. So this is the only place in the world you can find this plant. Well, I'm saying in Lee County, that's what that's what Kathy Olson knows about. But in this database, I only found it that it was found here in Lee County and uh, in Polk County or something like that. When I like wrote this off so nobody <laughs> steps on it. They need to put like some warning signs around. Sometimes, so. sometimes that's a wrong thing to do. Um, sometimes it's like orchids. You know, um, people will um, then purposely take it. So it's probably almost better just to let it run through its life cycle. And we actually are going to see some more as we are wandering through here. Pardon me? We're starting to get into the burn area there. And I want to caution you that that soot will get on your clothes if you even come close to one of those trees. I think it jumps off. <laughs> I've been very careful and I still come home with soot all over me sometimes. So uh, especially if you've got something white on because it'll hard, it's hard to get out, okay? And also, um, I, I, I want you to notice too that um, the, uh, the situation has changed here too. Look at how much denser these trees are. They were basically just waiting for a lightning fire and one occurred in July of last year and so you'll see the result because the trees were so close together that they that the the fire was able to jump crown to crown and Ron can speak to this because I was not doing these tours last year Ron was and so he knows he, he knew the the difference between well he'll tell you is this another <laughs> one of that same flower drawing hard to tell Hard to tell. The, it's definitely a pawpaw. This is definitely a pawpaw, but I don't know that it is the, the um, same one. Okay. The exactly the same one. Because so. there's an Asimina. It, it starts with the name Asimina, the, um, the taxonomic name. And this other one starts with the name Deer, Deering Joe something or other. So there are, there are different types of, of uh, at least a couple of different types of pawpaw. Here's another of, this, of these rose rushes. There we go. I found. Tar flower, and we saw the tar flower plant. This is the flower that actually comes on to the to the tar flower plant, and if you feel it. I, I welcome you to um, to touch the, the the petals. It's called tar, tar flower because the back of it has a stickiness to it, and that keeps the the bugs don't like that. The browsers don't like that. So um, so that's that's uh, an adaptation to keep things from munching on it. Here's a sw uh, zebra swallowtail. Oh, yeah. Zebra swallowtail that has yeah, been munching. Right. That munched on the um, the pawpaw mm -hmm. as a caterpillar. Very nice. Oh man, and he just pointed out something else. He is awesome. Oh, this goes to swallowtail. Okay, I want you to observe the 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 berries. These are the shiny blueberries, and look at how we've even got some young berries coming up here. Are these edible blueberries? They w they are. They will be. Now they're not in blue. They're but not right I yet, also but. want you to look at this. And anybody who can come in here oh, come is in here. welcome. What we are looking at is called. It's from an Exobacidium vaccini fungus. Oh wow! And what it does is the fungus will penetrate different parts of the plant and it's generally always going to be one of the ericaceas. In this case it's a stagger bush and then it completely um, it, it causes the, the plant to disfigure itself. And so what you see as this beautiful, I don't know, it looks like fruit-like, you can touch it it's incredible. This is actually a fungus wow. that has just deformed 
and completely change the composition of the of the stem this or the leaf or whatever it hit this from the fire isn't left. that wild yeah now I, I when been reading there's some here will we if we touch this will we move it to another plant later I wouldn't worry about it I, I mean I wouldn't worry about that being a problem because this is not a problem it's only a concern if you are a nursery and you're growing azaleas because azaleas happen to be in this family um, so and or they they, they can ca they can get this so but out here it's not a problem so the fungus likes a burn I mean this is the new burn area does the fungus proliferate well, in a burn um, I, I haven't read that as being an issue what I have read is that it really likes moisture and it spreads because just like any fungus it produces spores and so when it rains, the spores tend to splash up and then um, adhere themselves to another plant. These are not the fungus, those bald yeah. things. No, this is called the hymenium. So that the, is something the plant mix, not the fungus, right? That's right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, the fungus causes what, uh, the stem or the leaf, whatever, to deform. Bud. Could be a bud. Hey. Young blueberries on this one over here, too. We're going to see some more, actually, blueberries that are even more progressed. There are some little red berries. These are too young, though. Wait wait till we get up here a ways, and you'll see some black ones. Oh, yeah, she's got something with really red berries over there. I was asked about this. It's blue stem grass, because you can see that the grass itself is sort of a blue-gray color. Um, ooh, I think I passed by. Dang. I got carried away. No, I passed by something. Yeah, I'm sorry. Can you can you all come here? Okay, so we are in obviously the burn area. And the reason that I'm walking you back here is because we have one definite longleaf pine here that is doing very well whereas an awful lot of the other trees have died hmm. and it's this tree right here I'll walk back to it you can just stay where I'm, you are no. this tree right here and you can see when when Ron and I first came in here after the burn this tree looked like it was dead it had no green on it at all and you can see how these um, needles are coming out pretty good looking, yeah. pretty strong. Um, and the, the longleaf pine is a survivor of fire. And so if this actually survives and is able to throw off any of the bad results of the fire, it's going to be standing straight and strong. Whereas, look at these um, slash pines. They is are that, not doing so well. Is that also a long leaf, or is that the two pine that the just two happened together? to be taller? Well, we're not them. absolutely sure. This was never pointed out to us as being a, um, a long leaf pine. But I want you to look at some of these needles. These needles are not doing as well as these needles are. These are a little bit more curled over and a little bit more warped looking. And that can be an indication of potential disease down the road because of the hit that it took from the fire. Um, what will happen is in weaker trees that were not immediately killed off by the fire, then pine bark beetles will set in. Mm. And so you've just got kind of a compounding of, of problems. So that's sad for the tree, but it's a circle of life. It's a circle of life, that's right. Look at all of the berries on this. These are, these are not ripe. But look at all the berries on this blueberry bush. Do they turn blue? They do turn blue. We're going to see some on down there. Oh, dang. So it is really. Do the Black the stuff is They do. They do. And they protect a lot of other, their burrows will protect a lot of other so critters. Probably a mole. Probably just a, a, a mole. Probably a mole. Probably a mole. I didn't know moles lived in yeah. Florida. Yeah. Yeah, they do. And I can, I've never seen one. I want you to look at these saw palmettos. Um, 
these salt palmettos were burned down to the ground. You can tell that we're in the hottest part of where the fire was, or is certainly hot here. These were burned down to the ground, but look at how fast they come up. So yeah. what they do oftentimes in a managed burn is they will first of all come through and roller chop the saw palmetto because they do not, they are not able to burn, a, 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 an area like this should be burned every two to four years. And that's a hard thing to do, to get out here every two to four years Plus when you've got... a phenomenal volunteer and trained group to do well, that. These are not volunteers, they're, they're all professionals, they've got to be. And um, so they will roller chop first of all to get the, um, the, the woody part of the, uh, of, of the saw palmetto down and then they will burn. Um, so that, uh, then that just is like, is like a double whammy and, and really gets the saw palmetto down. Because this is very volatile, very volatile. It has very volatile um, oils in it. And so when this, then these catch fire, they will send up flames that are two to three times the height of themselves. Wow. So how did they come in and do that among all these trees? Well, I think that that's why they put off actually burning it. You see, this was not a managed burn that did this. This was a, this this was was a lightning July fire. Lightning that's right. Okay. That's right. This was the July lightning strike. So because they couldn't get in here. It was too dense. If the would or beer would explode, it would get the might up to the tops of the trees and oh, absolutely. Them, the bigger ones? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Huh. Doesn't the forestry service do that for... For it, it's like, kind of like a combination of forestry and the county. Um, Here's some more, believe it or not, this is all some, some more of that hymenia um, uh, produced by the exobacidium um, fungi. My gosh, and they look different. They do. They all look different. All different colors. Um, yeah, it's amazing. And yes, this like is soot. Oh, wow. Yeah, you should there not you have go. touched it. So what habitat is of, it's just like pine prairie, pine grassland up here? This is Mesic Pines. Mesic Pine Flatwoods. Oh yeah, it's kind of like grass and pines. Yeah, now this is... There's a really pretty flower out here, but I don't know that you necessarily want to walk out to it. Um, oh, yeah, but it is funny. called Pale Meadow Beauty. And um, it's growing here, obviously, uh, th with the burn area, lots of ash to um, uh, create the, the fertilizer, helpful fertilizer to make it grow, because we did not see this last year. And um, also, this is, uh, earlier in the year, this would have been a bog. Mm -hmm. And um, so there's lots of moisture here. So this is a very, very pretty little flower. So Pale that, meadow beauty. That's why... Are these trees that did have the heavy burn to them, are they going to remain for a long time upright or are they going to... They will the deteriorate on their own. Okay. They'll deteriorate on their own. Yeah, they are not going to take them out. Um, Next hurricane will be gone. Oh, yeah. yeah. Could be. Could be. But in the meantime, they provide a lot of nice habitat. And look over there. So, that cabbage palm. It's burned. Look at that. You see the trunk over there? That's camera yes. It's like no brown on the left. But I bet that it will live. I bet that it will make it. It is so cool. It's burned completely. Like that color. Well, what you should know is that when a sable palm feels that, um, that heat of fire, it drops off its boots. And you can see that that happened there because the boots are what catches the, f the flame and starts to burn and it just discards them. And so what's this flower over here? This um, flower, I'm glad you pointed that out. This is called rosy camphor weed. And I encourage you to touch the leaves and smell your fingers. It smells like camphor. And uh, the Indians used to use this, they would, um, uh, kind of crush it up into like a um, a liquid and um, rub it on um, bug bites. 
It smells and good. It's kind it of strong. smells divine. And isn't it camphor that we sometimes put on ourselves that we buy in a drugstore? Mm -hmm. Yep. Isn't it? Yeah. yeah, rosy camphor weed. Please do smell it. It's just it, it, absolutely, to me, it's divine. Maybe even this rubby thing on yeah, it to smell. Yeah, you're going you're gonna to see brighter ones along here. And again, see, this is. Is that an idea with swallowtail? open because of the fire. And so a lot of these herbaceous plants actually get a chance to grow. Because we used to walk in here before and all it was was pines and dirt. And now all of these nice herbaceous plants are beginning to grow. Back there that you see the first ferns here. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. And we think we think that these are lacy bracken ferns. Are they a Florida native fern? Yes. They are. So did he like chop down? Oh, look at all of this. Look at all of this rosy camphor weed over here. Beautiful. Yeah, this is unimaginable. This is where we found. So if it's ripe and, and we're hiking along the trail, are we allowed to eat this like by county law? Well, you can certainly taste oh, it, but remember... What butterfly is that? Yeah, that's a zebra swallowtail. He's probably looking for a host plant. Yeah, I was just asked if it's okay if you come in here and, and eat the blueberries. There's nothing to stop you from doing that. It's not illegal. But remember that this is... This is food for wildlife, too. And um, so, okay, you know, there would be other critters that would be coming through here that would really love to have a, a different... A different little meal on their table. Okay, I'll respect that I won't eat the berries. <laughs> oh, 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 here. What? Here's where we've got berries in all in all stages. Because now you can see the oh, ripe yeah, berries so too. Oh. See the ripe berries can here? Can I try one? Just no. exactly blue like um like you uh you know like you imagine blueberries to be, um, but anyway, look at look at how how wonderful this is. It's like a whole swamp. And exactly, of and believe me, this was not here last year. The this patch was not here last year. More but, here. Look at this. This is great. Yeah. Yes. But not another hymenium here. For it. Um, and uh, some more of this um, pretty false pawpaw plant. The endangered one, right? Yeah, this is the endangered one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's beautiful. Now I'm obsessed. <gasps> oh, look, this one. It's, what is it doing? It's sitting on a plant. Is it gone? It flew off? I don't see it. <gasps> oh, there. Yeah, that's what I was trying to yeah. say. Let's not get too close to it. But they're so pretty. It's precious. He may be looking for. Stop. He may yeah. be looking for a pawpaw. Oh my goodness! Zebra swallowtail. So it is. Very pretty. Yep. So everybody, what we're gonna do is. We are not going to do too much stopping on the way to the gopher tortoises. So we're, we've pretty much seen and talked about all the things that we're going to see in between here and there. So we're just going to head to the gopher tortoises right now. Yeah. And just so, it, just, you know, enjoy your, the surroundings. Yeah. Exactly. Enjoy taking a walk. Are these the fire breaks? These, these are the fire breaks. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay, so that is a corn snake. Can I touch it? No. no. <laughs> No. Where is it? It's on the ground. I, I think you want to look with your eyes first. I of all. see it. Whoa. Is How? that a poisonous snake? No, it is not. Um, corn snakes eat rodents, and they might even get up into a tree and eat a bird. Um, it's uh, more scared. It's beautiful. That is huge. It's a good snake. Absolutely. It's a good snake. Yeah. <laughs> it is not, this is not a poisonous snake, it's not a, um, it's not a viper. I'm pretty sure it was a corn snake. It was orange. It was orange. It was orange. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Orange. yeah. Like brown markings. Yeah. Where's, where's the snake? I saw a crawl into this saw palmetto here. Oh, you did? 
one? Yeah, but maybe it scurried off. How long was it, Elijah? It was moving pretty fast. Yeah, probably about a foot, maybe a little more. Yeah, that's what I'm going to say. You know, everybody focuses on that, which Sorry. is appropriate. Okay, we're gonna go down this way. So, do bears live here in this preserve? We do not have bears listed. Aww. So, I guess not. Unless if I see one. They live more like on in the interior. Of the state? Of the state. Like in, yeah. like the northerner. So, what's uh, this plant? That is um, fennel. This is dog fennel. And again, this is another plant that you can rub your fingers on and smell them. It's, um, they used dog fennel to put in the corners of houses in order to kind of dispel rats and things, rodents. And it wasn't because of the rats so much, it was because of the snakes, like the corn snake. So there's a nice little tie in here, Elijah. So. Snakes would come in after the rats. Exactly. Snakes would come in after the rats. Okay. What are you looking at? Oh, that's an easy one. No, that's a shrike. Where? That's a shrike up on the tree. Where? Well, it's the pine tree. That have like... Right out here. No, not that one. This one out here. Farther to the left, Elijah. But this it's going to be hard to see. And it's on the limb that's on the right hand side. The bare limb, sort of. Oh, I see it's like a bit. Yeah. I see it. I see it. Do the camera. Yeah, that's a, nor uh, a loggerhead shrike. It, oh, it just uh, jumped. Move, yeah. Back. I can see it through the camera. Yeah. I'm filming it right now. I can see it clearly. Good. Loggerhead shrikes are known for a very of, um, eating. eating. So, they're also called butcher birds. And so what they'll do is they have very weak feet. So they will grab like a lizard, a small lizard, in their bill, take it to a, um, a branch with kind of a pointy end sticking out of it, and then stick the, the, the lizard on the on the pointy branch and then eat from there. So they, it's kind of like... Words, they can't hold down the food with their feet and eat with their with their beak. They've got to um, have it in place. Kind of a lizard kebab. Yeah, lizard kebab. Thank you. I've heard this. Yeah. I like that. Log ahead trike. What's this? Well, this is part of the fire trail. They started to, they put in another fire trail um, during the fire. So that's... It's just another uh, another access point. And they can't. Now we're going to see actually a wonderful gopher tortoise um, burrow that we'll see the the entrance and everything. But this is a good place to start, y'all, watching for them. Basically, you want to look for a raised area like this because gopher tortoises they almost look like they almost have elephantine feet. And yeah. they actually go in and excavate the burrows. And um, generally, they are about 15 feet long. They go down about six feet. Although, in reality, they're going to go down only as far as the water table. Um, and we don't quite know where that is here. Um, gopher tortoises have actually, they come from a, from a species of tortoise that um, is 60 million years old. There are five tortoises in the United States. Only one is on the east side of the Mississippi, and that's our gopher tortoise. And now that we no longer have buffalo here in Florida naturally roaming, this is one of our biggest browsers. This is one of our most important browsers. Once you're going, what, what you are going to notice is Look at the, the trees here and look at all the grasses and look at how low the, um, the growth is. Like, We've been told 
that there are four times more gopher tortoises in this area that has had reliable burns, managed burns, than there are in the other area. Because when these little tortoises are born, when they hatch out of the shell, they're only two inches long. And they need to be able to get around small, low-growing plants. If things are too dense, they can't get from here to there. Exactly. 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 They can't get around. Gopher tortoises are extremely important to their environment. They are very important in terms of the other critters that live in their area. They're what is called a keystone species. And if you know in an arch, the keystone is the final stone that is embedded. And without that, everything else is going to fall. They're called a keystone species because 350 different critters, different types of critters, can use their burrow along with them. It's a place where if there's a terrible fire, rabbits and foxes and, well, anything that doesn't fly can race on down in there. There are species that live in there 24-7 with the gopher tortoise. So they never come out? No, they come out. The, the gopher tortoises do come out. No, the it's other, the other critters. There yeah. are certain other critters that don't come out or very rarely come out. But they're microorganisms that are important in and around. They're important for other reasons. Um, so, so they say that Pine Island Flatwoods is managed for the gopher tortoise which sounds a little bit crazy, but all that it means is that the gopher tortoise, in its 60 million years here, has developed certain needs. And those are the same needs as this pine flatwoods is. They're all these plants. So they all are symbiotic, symbiotically related. And so if you manage for the gopher tortoise, for good uh, gopher tortoise habitat, it's good habitat for everything else around. How big a gopher tortoise got? Well, you know, I have read that they get up to be 12 inches, but somebody else and Ron, who was it that you guys yeah. Yeah, we found one saved one? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I, yeah. I've wow. seen well over a long yeah. 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 yeah, I've seen one 10, about 10 pounds. Okay. I've seen ones about two sizes, about twice the size of a hat. Oh, my. That would be big. That would be very big, yeah. They'll live to be about 60 years old, too. Another problem for them, or a problem for them, is that the females may not be able to breed until they're 21 years old. And then they only lay, they, will, they, they may lay eggs every year, but they figure that it's only every 8 to 10 years that it's that 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 they actually hatch because they generally lay them on the ridge just outside their burrow and raccoons can get at them armadillos um, fire ants can get at them and so there's a lot of loss and so they are they're a species that um, they're they're not fast breeders and populators right 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 yeah. So let's walk along and, and watch for, for these. Um, what, I, what I planned to do, Ron, is unless you want to walk people in, I'm not going to be fond of doing that myself. We're going to, we're going to find, ah, we're going to find an area over here too where the burrows are right at, all we have to do is just look. And we, we always encourage people not to walk too much on the, on the, um, on the mound because it actually can't collapse the mound. Oh, okay. So that's why we don't like to have too many people out there. there. You see them all along here. Again, because this is um, uh, more regularly burned than that area over there, for instance. There, and there may be plenty of burrows in here, too. It's just that these are so nicely arranged right along the path. Being a tortoise that is rare, um, they come out a lot during the summer time 
they are not as active when it's cooler. Now, it's a warm day today, but um, they have to kind of re rev up their engines. So they're, they're out more like during the summertime. And you can walk up there. I can. Just do not walk on top of it. Um, you can walk up to it and look. Oh, I'm in. sorry. Just not walking on top. It's very hard, but oh, there's don't see anything in there, folks. You probably won't. You probably won't see anything in there. Well, what do you think the uh, concentration is? Uh, in well, a healthy population is four per acre. But what they do is they will build, one tortoise will have maybe eight to ten different burrows. Wow, my. Pretty smart. Pretty smart, because if you're out feeding and all of a sudden um, a dog is after you or a fire starts or something, then you've got another place that you can go to. Um, what other natural predators are there? Well, you know, once they reach... A certain size. Their only predators are would be like, I guess, a um, a bobcat. Definitely, what they say are dogs and people. And people ah. um, actually do sometimes eat them. That's horrible. And and so that that used to be a a problem. When they're very small, when they're only two inches, anything could you know could could be a problem for them. What do we have? Well, that's a good point. Yeah, we do have coyotes in this area. Coyotes? Yes. They weren't here before, though. That's a good no, point. They, they've, I have not noticed them until maybe the last five to ten years. They've kind of migrated into this area. I don't know what you think about that. I don't know if they've been there much longer than that. Now, it's just come to my attention that the, and, and it seems like the population out here on the island is growing Big quite time. rapidly. Yeah. Yeah, your question. Um, so, no, I did go. Baby, um, Babies get eaten by other, like, grown tortoises? No, no, no. They do not prey upon themselves. They're, um, they are herbivores. So they only eat grasses. They'll eat blueberries. They'll eat gopher, a gopher apple, pawpaw. Um, they love prickly pear. We haven't seen any of that. But they love prickly pear. And I'm talking about the cats. cats. Not just the fruit, but the pads. The thorns yeah, even with the thorns. I wanted thorns. to ask you, uh, how do they handle all of the rain? Doesn't the rain go into their power? Uh -huh. Apparently, they place their burrows so that that is not a serious problem. Now, maybe, if you stop to think about it, the burrow goes down. They don't have to go all the way down into it. They could go back up. Well, so I don't know would, about that. When I've seen... What gophers do, they go down and then they come back up. Right, yeah. but when I've seen pictures of the it like yeah, graphics, mm -hmm. it shows the, the burrow going down and then just leveling it off, leveling off. There's no evidence that there's an exit to, if that's yeah. kind of what you were asking, to uh, gopher, tortoise, tortoise burrows. It just goes in. Yeah. It doesn't come... They don't have the back door like well, the groundhogs and all do. As long as their heads mm -hmm. above the water level. Well, right? and they could walk out to. I'm imagining that, and probably another reason that they're here is that the water doesn't tend to puddle here and yeah. stand mm -hmm. like it does over there. You know, mm -hmm. see, we've got lots of different. We don't have just one soil type right. over <laughs> this property. Um, it could be that there's a lot of clay, a lot of silt under where Ron and I have walked through deep water and we've not been over here so it could be that this is sandier the um, it's deep you know it's Drainy deeper water. in terms of you know the, the the porous sand and so that it doesn't it is, so it doesn't create a problem can, can you tell us why we we're not seeing a lot of bird life or anything well I'm yes. hearing a lot of bird life and I actually am seeing a lot of flitting around um, you don't get, um, you, until it's spring and everything is trying to mate and attract attention to itself. 
I mean, I was actually, wondering I if, if it's it. because there's not Oh, that's two. Them. Now, you've got two birds together, uh -oh. actually. That's and they're probably a pair. And one just caught a dragonfly and oh. is eating it. I am filming it, eat it. I'm filming it, eat it. They, those are two shrikes. Can you see them? Yes. One, uh, yeah. So they may be setting up a nest, mm -hmm. um, uh, but uh, maybe this isn't the prime environment for the songbird. Or well, just not this time yet. these are not oaks either. Yeah. These are uh, oaks would probably be your best bet if you're into birding. Um, and right now we've got a lot of migrants coming in down at actually the uh, Sandbell Lighthouse. Um, but this is good territory for the birds that like this type of territory. Because there are lots of seeds on the ground, so you can get sparrows in here. A lot of things that skulk, that don't really want you to see them. And, you, and they, they don't need to be seen, um, so they're not going to, you know, come up and present uh, themselves. about the different sort of habitats we have. If uh, maybe some of you might want to do this sometime, you know, when we cross the uh, fire break down there, if you go west, this goes all the way to Pine Island Sound. Mm -hmm. So there's mangroves and stuff down there for you got another habitat. And what's you, you when we were out here one time, we were seeing a lot of marine birds because they do fly over here, although they're nesting and stuff all over yeah. that way. But oh, you do see some here. Yeah. Cover here. Boy, that's pretty doggone special. Wow. What's that? She made a... Uh... Oh, wow! That's pretty cool. What did you make that out of? The, the hat, hat pins. Yeah. Oh, aren't you clever? Yeah, is that... They are clever. Oh, that's darling! Isn't nice that Nice job! Did you make the... Wait a minute, you actually wove together the stems? Yeah, she braided yeah. them. Yeah. You For did that while we were walking? Yeah. Oh my God. I think I see a business in the future. Right. You do. She really is. Good job. I filmed a loggerhead eating the dragonfly. Great. My Good. camera is 60 clean zoom. So you can see, like, if there's a deer by the house over there, that's how far it can zoom. It can see the deer like if you're five feet from the deer. What kind of a camera is it? It's a video. Let me. What types of brown snakes will live out here? Well, we have a diamond bar. Don't we have a diamond bar? Yeah. Rattlesnake? Um, uh, but that's the only kind that I can think of. I, I, I think that that's the only rattlesnake that is, um, is found yeah. in Florida, well, I believe. No, I think there's a pygmy rattlesnake. Oh, well, that's a good point. Pygmy rattlesnake. It could be. Well, I would really have to look at the um, at the wildlife list in order to find out. Oh, give us all. How come we keep? How come we didn't see a gulf before? Them? Maybe in the burrows. They may be in the burrows. They may be out feeding. Um, they're going to wait until the sun comes up, until it's warm enough for them to get out and. Um, and search for food. Um, See, this how Washington burrows are messing around the stairs. Yeah, but you know what this is? This is limestone. It is? Yeah. You know, this is like, boy, our, our, our true base. Does it give me This is limestone here. This dates from when Florida was just nothing more than a platform underneath uh, the ocean. And um, it, it's, you know, compiled of, and you can even see it in there shells and everything else and then of course the sands have um have come up and, and covered most of it but this speaks to um just how different the um the under the understory under here the uh you know some of it's the limestone in this case is pretty close to the surface sometimes it's way deep underneath so um that's another complication or another complexity for the plants, you know, because they're going to have a hard time if they have, with their Getting roots, roots to get underneath. That. Right to get yeah. underneath that or around it. Yeah. Well, that is an animal trail. From what animal? Well, it could have been a raccoon. Um, that could be where the armadillo comes out. 
Um, hard to tell. Now what type Probably of once it's set up? What type of grass is that? I would say that's wire grass. Well, the fences are there so that people don't come in and use ATVs. And, what is the ATV? Um, well, those are vehicles that with very large tires. Oh and yeah. They could get out and destroy some of the um, some of the uh, the plants, sure, and rough up the the um, ground. Hey, this has strangler fig, remember? Yes, there's a strangler fig. Well, we're almost there. Wow. Uh, oh. Oh look, golf later Larry on the ground. Yes, good for you. Good well fine. see the passion vine. Yeah. And passion vine is the larval uh, host. host for that plant, so he would definitely see. Yeah, I so seen golf later Larry's. So that's probably why I've been seeing them in my backyard because I have his host plant. That's right. Yeah. It's a pretty little plant, isn't it? Probably yeah, I can. He could be just warming up. You know, um, he looks pretty young, pretty fresh. <laughs> he, like guy. he could have just recently come out of his cocoon. Chrysalis is for butterflies. Yeah. That's right. He's right. Cocoon is for moth and chrysalis is for, for butterfly. Yep. Oh, it flew off. What? There's, oh, there's another Where? Right oh, another. You should probably stay back so let's go where I am. It's another golf, I believe. It's another golf there, Larry. Because wings are a little wet. Bless you. It's another golf there, Larry, yes. He's a, he's a little bit rougher looking. Yeah. So I want to thank you for coming along. Oh, no. And oh, truly, thank you very much. Oh, well, I'll tell you something. If, if, if a group isn't curious and interested, it's hard to be interesting. I mean, you know, and, and make the, the material interesting. So thank you, truly. And thank you, Elijah. Thank you very much. No. no, this is actually our last one for the season. And it's because it gets Hot. next, even, yeah, even next month at this time of day, it'll be getting warm. Oh, okay. Well, watch in November or December because we'll start again. Um, doing this. It's in the paper. Yes. Yeah, it does end. Up. Hey, they caught up. Did they do one for golf? No. We have. Yes, they have, but not through us. Oh, oh, that's right. Um, yes. Run. What this is, and I can't remember it. Yellow top. That's called yellow top. No, it's not going to grow much taller than this. Well, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I'm going to take that back. No, this is St. John's Ward. I'm sorry. Isn't this St. John's Ward? No. It's not St. John's Ward? Look at the, look at the little staples on the little, um, these little things. Isn't this one of the St. John's Wards? It might be. Well, wait a minute, wait a minute. No, it's not. No, it's not because the sepals are not the same. No. This is yellow top then, I think. Let's see. Yeah. Shaving brush. Tiny red? Yeah. Oh. It looks like shaving brush. Yellow tops, okay. 105, let's see. 105. Yeah, that one stumped me today. Hey, what's this? I think this? that's what that is. What's Don't you think that that's what that is? It could yeah. be. And what's this? We do have, well, this is tick seed or coreopsis. I think that this is yellow tops. Well, actually, we normally every year have a lot of yellow tops. Um, a Flaveria linearis. Do, do, do you not think that that's what it is? No, I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the uh, St. John's Wort had four Thank petals. Four petals. Well, there's four petals and there's five petals. Oh, really? Sorry. And in this area, there's something like 24 different. I mean, not just on this 
um, preserve, but throughout Florida, there's something like 24. Oh, they were different. really good questions. They were really good questions. You were the best. Oh, thank you, Joe. Thank you, Gil. Oh, well, it's so much fun because there's always something different. Thank you. Good seeing you, Gil. Hey, baby. Good seeing you. It's nice to meet you. Nice meeting you, too. Well, it's nice. Like every day we come here, there's probably something different about this every day. There is. There absolutely is. Yeah, come on back. Um, thank you for coming along on the trip and staying the whole time. I, and um, I love that. Uh, uh, crown. 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 Yeah. crown. She said, put the yeah. crown back. She did a beautiful Job Absolutely. Wait, we're gonna open a shop in uh, Matt Lachey now. There you yeah. go. I, I think you should stop off at a guy named um, it's the Mullet Head Outpost. Mullet Head Outpost. Show him. He's in the two, twine. That's why oh, I like it. And he made Aww. a It's too small. A twine necklace. It's not too it's small, small Megan. Come on. Come on. Take it. His name is Nate Joe. And I think he'll really like it. And where's he located? Thank you. Pardon me? Oh. Where's he located? At what's called Mullet Head Outpost. His mom is Mel... Mayo. Mel Mayo. 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 His yeah. mom oh, is Mel Mayo. Mayo. Yeah. Is that yeah. on yeah. Pilot Island? That's or? on Pilot Island, right yeah. at the entrance. Oh. Right. Her, her yeah, shop? The There's her shop. Behind the subway. Behind the subway. Behind the subway. Behind behind the subway. Don't you think that he would love to see this? Because he, he's into twining. Sure. He's into twining. I think he'd love to see that. Yeah, sure. Yeah. yeah. Bye. 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 Bye.